So first, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for uh, inviting me, uh, a bit less for giving me the pleasure to be the last uh, speaker, but uh, uh, I'm happy to see that there are still people in, uh, in the room. I hope I will not be disappointing you too much. But so uh, today, I will try to uh, <clears throat> basically discuss and uh, try to convince Dima, if he's still around, uh, that uh, uh, some part of the SNF can be, uh, can be useful in case of uh, complex order discrimination. So I will basically try uh, to uh, see what kind of neural coding is taking place uh, in the olfactory bulb, the, tr the, the computation and the transformation that is done inside the olfactory bulb to transform uh, the glomeruli map into uh, ensemble recordings, ensemble representation that will be delivered to the, to the cortex. And I will try to uh, also give you some uh, um, data that uh, uh, analyze the stability versus the plasticity of representation when uh, we learn to discriminate odors. So the first thing that we are going to look at is basically uh, uh, um, classical uh, examples uh, that we know in, in humans that uh, every, everyone knows that if we drink uh, wine, you know, as a, a very normal and regular human beings, we usually have a hard time to discriminate uh, a Bordeaux 95 from a Bordeaux 59 or uh, a Bordeaux from a Chardonnay. But uh, uh, this is a, uh, these things can be learned. Uh, you can, you, we know that sommelier can basically uh, be trained to recognize. And the question is how, you know, this representation that they have in the brain can be influenced by, uh, by training. So as you may know, a couple of weeks ago, we elected our new French president, and these are uh, the two last candidates. And what you may not know is that basically we choose our president not based on their, on their program, but based on wine testing. I mean, that's the usual tradition in France. So here you see Emmanuel Macron, that is now our president, and the evil woman that we had to expel from the, uh, from the presidency. And you can see that in the wine testing, uh, paradigm, she was already, you know, knowing that basically she would not make it. But we had to basically, you know, train those people, and eventually, uh, after the vote, we biased the, the, the program, uh, the, the, the contest, and, uh, you know, we helped Emmanuel to become uh, our president. So the question is, you know, if he had the time to basically uh, uh, train himself, how the representation would evolve in, inside, uh, inside the brain, and what could be the stability versus the plasticity issue inside the olfactory, olfactory system. So we are not studying humans because they are very weird and complex social interaction, as you can see here during uh, the Independence Day, 4th of July, with the beauty and the beast, as we call. And you can see this very strange dance that uh, we have you know, I let this for 30 seconds, and you will see that it engaged even other people. <laughs> only, only the American president can do that. Okay, so in Switzerland, and as a French uh, citizen, uh, we are more concerned about uh, uh, the stimulus we are using, uh, and we are not using uh, uh, humans, as I said, but we are using uh, rodents. And rodents do enjoy uh, not only cheese and wine, as you can see in this video. So, you know, if we go to a brewery, you would see that uh, uh, mice can basically learn, you know, to appreciate wine. And eventually, <laughs> at the end, you know, we would not have the fancy type of uh, uh, analysis of behavior that Andreas is doing. But you will see that at the end, you have a, a discrimination task that can be uh, set up for, uh, for mice. <laughs> Okay, so we are going to, uh, to just focus today uh, uh, the representation inside the olfactory bulb. I'm not going to go into a lot of details about you know, the, the uh, coalescence of receptors that you have heard extensively over the last four, uh, four days, uh, but I will concentrate on you know, the olfactory circuit. We will concentrate our recordings in the mitral and tufted cell uh, population and see what kind of computation is done in the circuit by interaction with this uh, population of interneurons, the granule cell layer interneurons, and uh, eventually also the glomerular layer interneurons. 
Okay, so the first thing that we, uh, that we know is that if we try to image uh, other representation in the olfactory bulb, you have seen some of these uh, uh, recordings uh, in Dima's talk, for example, in other talk, uh, that if you use, for example, natural odors, here we would have a banana, a fresh banana a smell and a fresh kiwi smell, that means that we press the two, the two fruits, and we see the odor representation evoked in the uh, dorsal olfactory bulb of uh, the same awake uh, head-restrained mice. Basically, what you see here with intrinsic optical signal imaging, that the representation activates a large number of glomeruli, and that the combinatorial code is uh, very clear. You have tons of glomeruli that are activated uh, by the two odorants, uh, but that the, uh, the patterns are extremely different. So for these complex blends uh, uh, that evoke very different percepts, you know, the, the representation uh, at the combinatorial level would be sufficient uh, to uh, discriminate uh, those representations. So we are not going to use uh, today uh, the uh, natural compound, but we'll use the uh, monomolecular compound that uh, induce the similar kind of uh, percept, etibutyrate and amyl acetate, and we will compare a single uh, monomolecular representation versus binary mixture of these two compounds with different ratios. And we know from uh, work that we initiated when I was a postdoc in the Sackman lab, uh, working also with the uh, with Andreas, that if you mix uh, uh, these two monomolecular compounds, like 60% banana plus 40% kiwi, and the opposite ratio for the other mixture, if you monitor here in calcium imaging, but you would have the same in other type of imaging uh, uh, um, monitoring, the representation at the input level, you see that the representation is uh, uh, extremely uh, uh, similar. So the question that we addressed at that time, and uh, you know already uh, the answer, is that whether this representation that we see here and these two mixtures would be discriminated by, by the mouse. So we use uh, different uh, go-no-go -go assays, and so we have different, uh, throughout this presentation, there would be two different type of assays, one that would be freely moving, and that uh, was initiated uh, uh, while uh, being in Heidelberg with Andreas, and uh, there is a a version that is a head fix that basically gives the same, uh, the same result uh, uh, that we, uh, we see uh, uh, in, the, in the mouse. Okay, so what we know is that uh, if you train animal to discriminate simple odors, uh, uh, monomolecular odors, they learn very quickly to discriminate and make this association in the go-no-go -go task. And if you train later on uh, the mixture uh, to be discriminated, we see that uh, the learning is also very quick. And uh, what Andreas has mentioned already is that uh, uh, we know that these mixtures uh, take longer to be discriminated, about 100 milliseconds on average uh, uh, that uh, we need to add uh, for the uh, proper discrimination. So we see here that this is a common theme in the, in the field now, uh, that a single sniff is, in, is sufficient to basically uh, recognize uh, uh, these, uh, these orders. So the first thing that uh, uh, we, would we wanted to know is basically, is uh, the imaging I showed you before was done on naive animals. So whether uh, the, the map representation here after learning is different, and that would explain why the animal can actually discriminate. Maybe at the beginning it's hard to discriminate, but they learn to discriminate, and this would change their representation. So we tested that uh, with different, uh, different type of odors, and uh, what we observed here, uh, we compared trained mice versus uh, uh, naive mice, that means uh, mice that have uh, never been doing any behavior, to mice that were trained uh, but without any, uh, any rewards or just exposed to the same number of trials for the same orders. And what we see is that over uh, a range of concentration, the amplitude of the odor evoked response here monitored by intrinsic signal imaging is uh, increased in the trained animals. So that means that the strength of the response to a particular odor at a given concentration is higher. But if we correlate the representation between two odors, so that means if we see whether the similarity has changed between uh, two uh, uh, odors, what we observe is that be, uh, for the monomolecular odors, the patterns are uh, decorrelated so that they are separated for uh, uh, amine acetate and etibutyrate. They are very, very different over a large scale of concentration, and the mixtures are highly correlated over a large uh, scale of concentration. And the training you see here uh, is basically uh, not altering the, the representation. So that means that although there is a plasticity, 
uh, induced by associative learning. So you improve the strength of the representation. You are not changing, in fact, how the representation similarity is. So if you have two orders that evoke uh, input patterns that are nearly identical, uh, it's not changing by, uh, uh, by associative learning. And so the question is how the mouse is actually making the difference between those two representations if the learning is not altering uh, dramatically the input maps. So to uh, address that, and considering that uh, uh, we have to uh, uh, nail down the mechanism at the single sniff level, we initiated uh, recording instead of calcium imaging that would be relatively slow uh, to monitor uh, or mitral and tufted cell response. So we implemented uh, uh, tetrad recordings in a wake uh, and anesthetizer uh, preparation, and we basically monitor the response of uh, large uh, cell assemblies to uh, other response. So you see here one of these uh, uh, cell assemblies. So you see here, ex uh, for example, neurons. Uh, this would be uh, the inspiration in gray and the expiration in white. Different respiratory cycle. This is the first respiratory cycle after other onset. And every spike is basically a, a, a bar. You see the response uh, uh, to the same order across different, different cells. And what you can easily see is that the response is quite variable from, an, from cell to cell, but it's uh, reliable from trial to trial. So the trials here uh, are evoking the same response. So we, uh, uh, based on the literature uh, in, the, in, in the motor system and also work by Gilles Laurent, we uh, decided to analyze the other evoked response in cell assemblies using population vector analysis. So that means that we look at all the cells, uh, not by averaging their response altogether, but seeing the activity in the population uh, describing uh, this uh, activity over time. So population vector are nothing else than basically a vector where each line is the rate of a given, a given neuron. And what we do is basically a time series where over time we see uh, the rate of a particular temporal window that is uh, uh, fed into the, uh, each line of this, uh, of this vector. So, so it depends, I mean, between a couple of cells to up to 30 or 40 cells. Yeah, all by SNP. Yeah, all the, all the, all this, all the recording are done uh, with the SNP sensor. For DIMA, the uh, other application is uh, temporally locked to the expiration, so everything is, is time locked, and so basically we can realign everything from animal to animal. We looked at the, 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 the finding inside a given animal, and we find the same as across animals, so it does not really, does not really matter. Okay, so what we can do basically here, we have, as you have heard already, the, uh, the different talks, so we have, in this case, 101 dimensions, so uh, basically, with the population of cells that we record gives a space of 101 dimension, and what we see with this population vector is basically a trajectory of activity that is described in this multidimensional space. And because many people have introduced the PCA a reduction uh, of dimensionality, I don't have to uh, go too much into detail. And so, basically, what we are going to look at is uh, the, uh, the evolution of the population activity evoked by an order in this multidimensional space but uh, reduced to the, pre the first three principal components. And I have to say that uh, more than 90% of the variance is captured uh, in these uh, uh, three principal components. So what you see here is basically the activity in the cell assembly that we have recorded uh, before another application. And to our surprise, what was not very obvious at the single cell level turned out to be a very clear uh, uh, phenomenon at the population so that we have a resting state activity that is describing uh, basically an inspiration expiration cycle that is over and over again uh, coming back uh, in, this, uh, in this activity. And so as soon as we have an order that is applied, you see that the representation goes away from this resting state and uh, enter in a pseudo-cyclic trajectory uh, that uh, eventually set up after a couple of breathing cycles into a kind of uh, uh, steady state that we see, uh, that we see here. So if we see this representation in a non-animated way, so basically we leave the first inspiration after order onset would be here, and then you have the expiration, and then you move progressively into this uh, uh, progressive, uh, uh, progressive respiratory cycle, and you change the representation. 
So what, what it shows here and what I should mention is that each point here is basically a snapshot every 40 milliseconds. So what we see is that the representation every 40 milliseconds is described in a different part of the trajectory. And this is basically meaning that a subpopulation of mitral and tufted cell is encoding the representation of the order at uh, uh, every 40 milliseconds. And every 40 milliseconds, it's somehow, because the representation is, is changing in the, in the space, is a different cell assembly that is, uh, that is uh, representing the, uh, the order. So what we uh, also notice that if you uh, uh, compare orders uh, 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 together, so uh, basically you have uh, uh, here the green uh, order versus the magenta order that are unrelated, that would be the uh, uh, ethyl uh, butyrate versus amyl acetate, very different representation. You see that the representation and the trajectory of recording are nearly orthogonal in the, in the space. So this is not you know, very difficult uh, to uh, discriminate those kind of representation in this multidimensional space. Now, if you compare these uh, two orders that would be much more uh, related to each other, that could be uh, concentration, I mean, small difference in concentration of the same order, or binary mixture, you see that the representation is actually much more similar between, uh, between those, uh, those two representations. It's similar, but it's not identical. So if you unfold the space here, you see that there is uh, a difference between the two representations. And so we wanted to know is basically uh, the mixture representation that we see here could be uh, uh, discriminated by a, pa a process that is called pattern separation. So those representations are nearly identical. They are not exactly the same, but uh, people have uh, uh, speculated over nearly 40 or 50 years that there are in the brain mechanisms that basically take a, a, a correlated input and as a product of the uh, local network processing would give less correlated output uh, from, the, from the network. And among the different circuits that have been proposed, the olfactory bulb is supposed to be one of these uh, 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 networks that could do uh, pattern separation. Although no one has really demonstrated that this is true in mice and, and it's actually useful for behavior. So we uh, wanted to test this uh, uh, two questions. So can correlated inputs be separated into distinct output patterns by the olfactory bulb network? And does this pattern separation, if it exists, would help really animal to uh, discriminate uh, orders? So in other words, if you have these two trajectories that look very close to each other, is there a, a, inside the olfactory bulb network a mechanism that tend to increase uh, the, the distance between those representations in order to make the mouse uh, discriminating more easily? So the first thing that we did, we created a stimulus space that would be uh, uh, basically uh, varying into uh, uh, similarity. So that we'd have uh, uh, mixtures that would be very easy to recognize uh, with nearly no overlap in the, in the, in the, uh, in the glomeruli uh, uh, until uh, uh, others that would be very uh, uh, similar uh, in the input pattern. So, for that, we use binary mixtures, I will show you in a moment, and we quantified uh, uh, with the calcium imaging uh, uh, in single trials the dynamics and the, the spatial maps uh, that would be evoked by uh, different, uh, different mixtures. So you see here, for example, of these mixtures, so in fact, there would be 16 different mixtures. Uh, uh, we have uh, two categories of mixtures, so one, mixture, one type of mixture contains the amyl acetate and antibutyrate uh, uh, components. And we vary different ratios uh, uh, in, uh, in different mixtures. And we have a different set of mixtures in which we have uh, ethyl butyrate and hexanon. So ethyl butyrate would be a common uh, monomolecular order to the two uh, mixtures, but uh, the, the, the other component would be, uh, would be different. So what we uh, basically did, ba we, we had 16 different mixtures of uh, eight uh, uh, of this pair, eight of this pair, uh, just changing the relative ratios. And then we looked at the other response in all the glomeruli, uh, created a, a vector uh, of response in this uh, glomeruli uh, population and compared across uh, others, the other evoked similarity uh, of the pattern. So if you take, for example, this pattern versus this pattern, you would see that you have a high correlation that would be shown by these reddish uh, uh, colors. If you uh, compare these two patterns, 
we see that you have a strong correlation also across the different orders uh, that share uh, ATP butyrate and hexanone. But if you compare these two, uh, 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 these two mixtures, uh, they vary in similarity. So some of them are uh, very low correlated and you have everything in between high correlation and low correlation. So like that, we could, we could create a stimulus space that would basically span, uh, we think, the entire space of possibility of similarity in this, uh, in this experiment. Okay, so this is the, the input space. We created it for, for on purpose. The question is what will happen at the uh, level of the output? So for that, we recorded the uh, population of mitral and tufted cell, and basically the firing activity that will be uh, uh, recorded from the mitral and tufted cell will be the, uh, the information transfer to uh, downstream cortices. So you see here the example of uh, some of the, the recordings. Uh, basically, we uh, recorded uh, 100 cells, roughly, and uh, we uh, uh, created, again, a, a population vector correlation analysis where we, com we computed all possible correlation uh, for all the other evoked response uh, by these 16 different mixtures. So like that, we can see uh, uh, how similar all these uh, output, uh, output representation can be. So what I, 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 I have not mentioned so far that this activity is the mean, is the average rate uh, or the average calcium response on the first uh, respiratory cycle. And so what you can see here is that the representation uh, uh, has uh, uh, somehow changed. So if you don't remember how the input was, so you can see the input was organized like that. And the output representation is extremely, is ex extremely different. So some others tend to be uh, 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 decorrelated, so separated uh, more than it was at the input level, uh, and other orders uh, are actually even more correlated at the output than they were at the input. So overall, we observe that uh, uh, some orders can be separated by the olfactorial network, not all, so the overall tendency is to decrease uh, 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 the correlation that we see at the input level, but uh, it's not a linear process, so it's more reformatting of the representation and we, cannot, we don't know right now why some others are, are separated and not, uh, not other others. So what is important to know is uh, what is the time scale of this uh, uh, pattern separation process? Because we know, uh, again, as I mentioned in the introduction, for a long time that uh, it takes a couple of hundreds of milliseconds for the mouse or the rat to discriminate uh, uh, complex orders. So what we did was to basically analyze the data now in the first sniff, but just taking the information every 20 milliseconds, roughly 21 milliseconds here, and just to see how fast the decorrelation process uh, would, uh, uh, would take. And what you see here is that uh, we, uh, we started at that time point that is the maximum of the input correlation, so that basically it takes uh, uh, on average about 40 to 80 milliseconds to decorrelate representation across all the, the metrics here. Some others are decorrelated more rapidly than others, uh, but on average, that's uh, what it takes. So that means that uh, not only we, the, pat the olfactory verb can do pattern separation, but it, do it does it at a time scale that is relevant for rodent behavior. Because uh, for, many, uh, for many years, we had uh, uh, intense discussion uh, uh, with Rainer Friedrich, for example, that uh, demonstrated pattern separation or decorrelation in the fish olfactory system, but that would take much more time than uh, uh, it would be uh, uh, allowing for the behavior in rodents. So this, at least, is consistent with the behavioral data that we have a mechanism potentially uh, uh, at the relevant time scale. If you have any question, if, you, if it's not clear, just uh, uh, interrupt me uh, anytime. Yes. Yeah, so here, I mean, we, we can discuss about it. Uh, we, we can correct for the, the change in the firing due to the respiration. Um, we know that when we breathe, we have more firing after the, uh, the inspiration, and it doesn't change anything. Yeah. I don't think it's the case that has the same Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I completely, I completely. Okay, so because we we have done, you know, this large array of comparison, you know, we have uh, 16 by 16 comparison, I mean, in fact, divided by two, so we can select uh, uh, pairs of orders 
that would be either decorrelated or still correlated at the output level of the olfactory bulb and ask the mouse, is it really useful to have this decorrelation for you? Can you discriminate more easily the odors that are separated by the uh, uh, olfactory bulb? Or is it really you know, an epiphenomenon? If it's an epiphenomenon, then you know, we move on and we do something else. Okay, so we selected 11 uh, pairs of odors that I said uh, would vary in uh, similarity or correlation of the output of the olfactory bulb, so from ranging for odors that would be nearly completely decorrelated or, uh, or others that would be still highly correlated. And you see here some of these uh, 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 pairs. So uh, we have very simple orders that you know, uh, would show the, uh, the tendency uh, to learn very quickly to discriminate these other pairs. And you see here uh, many of these mixtures. You don't have to look at the name. It does not really matter. Some of them are, are learned fairly quickly, like these ones. Uh, some are intermediate, and others are, are much harder to, uh, to discriminate. So basically, we took the uh, accuracy uh, over this uh, uh, initial period of learning as a, uh, an indication of the, uh, the ability of the mouse to discriminate more or less easily uh, the, um, the, the two orders. And we, comp we, we plotted uh, uh, the, uh, this uh, discriminability index as a function of either the input correlation at the glomerulus level or uh, the output uh, of the olfactory level. So what you, see, what you see here is that uh, uh, this is the input. So that means that the maps of the glomeruli uh, uh, can basically uh, uh, not predict very well the behavior of the mouse. So uh, for some odors that are uh, uh, having a very high correlation, for example, at that level, some of them are discri easily discriminated and others uh, uh, are not. Uh, uh, so this is uh, basically what we knew from, from, from the past, so that the input uh, map is not sufficient to predict behavior. But if we look at the output of the olfactory bulb, if you look at the mean uh, output correlation in the first respiratory cycle or the minimum uh, output correlation in the first respiratory cycle, we see that we have a much better uh, 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 correlation uh, of the activity to the behavior. So that means that the more you separate representation in the olfactory bulb network, uh, the easier you can predict uh, the behavior and the easier it is for the mouse uh, to discriminate when uh, uh, output correlation is, uh, uh, is low. Okay, so this, is, uh, this, is ver this was very encouraging, but uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, this is not a, a causal uh, uh, relationship. So we aimed at uh, trying to demonstrate that basically this uh, pattern separation process would actually be really useful uh, uh, for behavior, and that's not just, again, an epiphenomenon. So I will show you two different types of uh, modulation that we did, the, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and we tried... Uh, to alter so this uh, pattern separation process. So the first, one of the first that we tested was basically a collaboration with uh, uh, Thomas Jensch from Berlin, where we decided uh, to uh, uh, alter all the inhibitory load uh, that the mitral cell are receiving by altering the uh, chloride gradient. So we selectively inactivated uh, the potassium chloride uh, co-transporter specifically in mitral tufted cell using uh, uh, cell type specific uh, uh, um, uh, recombination in mitral cells. So we use PCDH21 creline uh, uh, crossed with a, a, a flux uh, KCC2 uh, uh, knockout. So uh, what, what ends up is that we, we mostly uh, remove all the uh, KCC2 uh, from mitral cell and we still leave some KCC2 uh, uh, from cells that are not mitral cell uh, uh, like uh, periglomerular, periglomerular neurons. So when you do that, you basically change the uh, chloride gradient, and uh, it's stuck. I'm sorry for that. That's not the chloride gradient. <laughs> um, Yeah. Sorry, Microsoft crashed. Yeah, yeah, ask, please, please. Yeah. 
see that they are different. They are extremely different. So that, that was one of our uh, uh, first surprise. So we always thought that th this would lead to same kind of uh, mixtures, but it turned out that uh, the liquid mixture are way more different than they should be in, uh, uh, from the theoretical point of view. So the liquid mixing is giving m more different uh, uh, odors, mixtures, than they are uh, in the uh, uh, air mixing condition. I mean, we spent six months trying to uh, do uh, uh, a very precise uh, uh, gas chromatography and try to find a relationship and the logic, uh, and we, we could not find something. For, for one other pair, uh, for one other mixture, there was a, 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 a logic, and it was the opposite logic in the other other uh, mixture. So we discussed with, I mean, it was not at Firmenich, so with people that know what they do, and yeah, they say that it would take you know, probably a lot of years to, to model that, and so we just gave up. And so we, we took that as a fact, and that was, uh, that was it. But so, yeah, definitively there is a difference between the two, uh, the two mixtures, uh, the two ways of mixing. Okay, so I, I apologize for, the, for this uh, uh, intermission. Um, so if we... Um, Okay, so if we, if we uh, change the chloride gradient, the expectation is that basically you uh, uh, change, uh, uh, you know, the, the GABA uh, response so that if you, uh, if you look at the reversal potential here, you have a, a more depolarized uh, uh, reversal of GABA currents, which basically when you uh, apply GABA, would make in a wild type usually an IPSP, so an hyperpolarization. And in the case of the KCC2 uh, specific uh, mitral cell knockout, we would have a shunting inhibition, but we would not have an hyperpolarization of the, of the cell. So uh, uh, all the mitral and tufted cell uh, uh, were, were like that. So the, this was changing the properties of the, of the odor evoked response. I will not enter too much into the detail. Um, I hope it's not going to crash again. So I think I will, uh, I, I, mean, I will stop using the laser, the, the pointer. I think this is the, the problem. Okay, so um, if, we, uh, if we apply a different, uh, uh, different mixture, so here they are not the same as in the previous experiment, so, but, but uh, we have some others that are simple others, uh, others that are binary mixtures. And what you see is that in the wild type uh, uh, mouse, Basically, some others are highly, co highly correlated and other others are more decorrelated. And in this uh, mouse in which we, sh we modify the inhibition, we uh, basically uh, modify uh, the correlation pattern uh, in this mouse. So we uh, strongly increase so the, uh, the, the correlation among different others. So that means that we deteriorate uh, the pattern separation process by manipulating uh, the inhibition that uh, is received by the olfactory uh, interneurons that is uh, uh, received by mitral cell from uh, olfactory babin neuron. And if we uh, use a prediction algorithm uh, on this data set, we basically uh, strongly impair our capability to uh, recognize orders. But to, uh, uh, of course, uh, be more direct, we ask the mouse to uh, uh, recognize some of these orders, and some, some orders are actually uh, still uh, recognized by, uh, by the mice and can be discriminated, uh, uh, but the, the orders that have uh, that are the higher the, that have the highest correlation are actually extremely uh, 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 difficult for the mouse to be uh, discriminated. So this was the first hint that uh, uh, manipulating the GABAergic network uh, could impair uh, patterns, the pattern separation process, and this would alter uh, the um, uh, the behavior of the of the mouse. But we wanted to be uh, yeah yes. Yes, uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, and no. Uh, if we overall yes, but the problem is that in these experiments, uh, so in in the other experiments, everything was the same. So the mouse were head fixed, 
the, the olfactometers meters were the same, uh, and the behavior was done on the same kind of setups as the recordings. In this case, the recordings were done head fixed, and the behavior was done in freely moving animals. So the comparison for the concentration and the relative ratios, because as I said before, they are not exactly the same, I would not make a very strong claim about the direct uh, relationship. But overall, it was, it was the same tendency, but was not as a, a nice uh, regression line. Okay, so uh, uh, we, we wanted to uh, test another uh, type of manipulation that we could control uh, um, in precise timing. And so we, and also to go into some pot potential uh, sub uh, class of interneuron that would be important. So here we targeted uh, based on uh, work done by Andreas uh, in the past uh, and uh, Nixon Abraham that you, you can inject in the granule cell layer uh, AAV and modify uh, genetically. Uh, uh, a large fraction of the, the granule cell population. And so we use two different uh, uh, approaches. We use one where we force the expression of uh, channel adapsin, so light-gated uh, a channel that will, upon light stimulation, will lead to the excitation of the GABAergic uh, uh, interneuron of granule cell layer. And the second modulation that we, uh, we used was basically to force the expression of an inhibitory dread construct. So that's a GPCR that has been mutated to be only responding to this inert molecule, uh, clozapine enoxide, and this uh, uh, GPCR is coupled to uh, uh, GIO signaling, so that means that when we stimulate this uh, with CNO, we basically hyperpolarize and uh, reduce the excitability of the interneurons. Okay, so we have two opposite manipulation, increase the excitability of the granule cell layer interneurons or reduce the excitability of the granule cell layer interneurons. So basically you see here uh, the, uh, the, the staining for uh, the MC twin coupled to the, to the dread. And uh, so this is not done in the Vigard cream mouse, but basically the, the, the spatial location was sufficient to restrict uh, the expression in the, in the granule cell and even when we had cells that were close to the mitral cell layer, uh, the mitral cell were uh, left uh, uh, uninfected. On average, we, uh, across uh, several animals, we, we had, a, for both manipulation, about 30 to 40% of the granule cells that were, that were affected, and all the mice uh, in which we had, for example, targeted uh, uh, also the uh, anterior olfactory nucleus were, were removed. Okay, so uh, the experiment uh, was done uh, uh, for the uh, channel adapsin uh, manipulation with an LED. So we uh, got inspired from a work done by uh, Pierre-Marie Ledo. So we basically, we uh, perform a cranial window on the dorsal surface of both olfactory bulb and implanted an LED that would cover the entire dorsal surface of the olfactory bulb and uh, uh, hoping that this would basically stimulate uh, the granule cell uh, roughly uh, a bit everywhere. So the protocol is, uh, is like that. So we have a masking light that is uh, just uh, uh, on the, the, the eye of the animal uh, that it would not see the light stimulation coming from the, the LED. We have a baseline period, then there is the odor. The animal is supposed to leak uh, uh, during this odor period, and the LED stimulation is at 40 hertz. It's basically coupled to uh, the other onset that is itself coupled to uh, the uh, respiration. And if the animal leaks at the end of the other, uh, we'll get a, a reward. And so for Adi Ad, uh, Rafi Haddad, I, I uh, added this, uh, this slide that you could see uh, how this uh, works uh, uh, with the sensor. So basically, it's not very clear for the moment, but with the light, you will see in a moment. Uh, uh, here you have the head of the mouse. There is the other port uh, that arrives on the right nostril. There is a, a, a pressure sensor that is close to the left nostril. And we have here, uh, basically, the uh, uh, LED that is uh, uh, mounted and connected uh, uh, to the, to the uh, power regulator. And so when we, uh, uh, when we apply, uh, uh, when we start a trial, the, there is the masking light, then there is the, 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 the delay. And then uh, at some point when the odor is coming in, you see here uh, the flash uh, that we have increased in this case to see it uh, uh, through the, uh, the dental cement, uh, the light stimulation uh, arriving onto the platform. So if you see it on the side, the mouse is here. Uh, there is a leaking port. It's getting the odor and is uh, uh, responding by uh, leaking onto this, uh, onto this leaking tube. OK, so uh, there is one aspect that uh, I want to, uh, to, to, to mention here. Of course, you know, 
if we uh, infect 30 or 40 percent of GABA urging in neutrons, and if we stimulate and shine light and synchronize them, uh, uh, we may uh, uh, lose percept by a, a very strong uh, total inhibition of the mitral and top cell. And that's what we see in these experiments, where basically uh, we can increase uh, the light intensity uh, applied on top of the bulb. And in, in this experiment, the mouse are just uh, asked to report whether they smell an odor. So if they smell an odor, they start leaking. So the odor on set is at zero. And when they, when they smell that there is something, then they leak uh, uh, to report that they have smelled something. And what you see is that uh, if you go uh, at uh, uh, zero power, they have this leaking uh, property. And if you increase progressively, uh, you lose the leaking, uh, the leaking uh, property, which for us we take as a sign that the mouse doesn't smell anything anymore. So that we basically shunt the activity in the, in the bulb by synchronizing the, the granule cell that we have infected. What you see here, of course, this is not the condition we want to have. I mean, we want to have the animal learning to discriminate and not just having no discrimination because we uh, shut down the mitral cell activity. So we uh, uh, selectively, uh, for each mouse, uh, regulated the, uh, the power of the LED until the, uh, the minimum uh, intensity that would uh, recover the baseline activity without, uh, without light. And each mouse has a different profile based you know, on the accessibility of the, the, the cranial window, the number of cells that were infected. So each mouse has been regulated. So what you would see is basically a, a, a non-blast uh, of the olfactory bulb uh, interneurons that we do is more a kind of excitation uh, uh, assisted uh, 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 manipulation that is, uh, that is done. Okay, so uh, this is one slide basically summarizing a lot of work. Uh, so we would see here the, granule, the, the mice that have been modulated by the chanerodopsin uh, uh, infection in granule cell neurons. These are other mice that, will be, that have been infected uh, with the, uh, excited, the inhibitory dread. And you see here the control of these mice, so either light off or before the CNO application. So these are the other evoked rates recorded in the mitral and tufted cell. So we see how many spikes they generate uh, after uh, other response, so all the mixtures. And uh, when we uh, apply uh, the light, uh, as one would expect, we inhibit the mitral and tufted cell when, by recruiting the interneurons. And when we, we inhibit the, mitral, uh, the, the interneuron, we inhibit the mitral and tufted cell. So there is nothing really special here. Uh, the, mouse, the, the cells are still responding, but we alter their firing pattern. And this, we did that uh, because in the literature from uh, various groups that model uh, the process of uh, pattern decorrelation in the olfactory bulb, they suspected that uh, the interaction, the interplay between uh, GABAergic and, and glutamatergic cells would regulate the, the, the fine tuning of the temporal uh, spike pattern and that would uh, basically lead to uh, decorrelation. And so our, our hope was that basically by manipulating here and having a bit more inhibition uh, than, than usual, we would uh, change the level of correlation between uh, similar uh, orders. And that's what we, uh, what we saw. So when we, uh, when we inhibit uh, uh, the, the, when we stimulate the granule cell, uh, we alter uh, the pattern separation process and we improve uh, this computation uh, in the olfactory, uh, in the olfactory bulb. And the opposite manipulation is obviously degrading the, uh, the pattern separation process. So now we had two different ways of manipulating on demand uh, a computation done in cell assemblies. And we asked whether the mouse would basically improve or not, or, or degrade or not their learning capability. And what you see here is that if you improve pattern separation, uh, you improve, uh, in fact, uh, learning uh, to discriminate those mixtures. And if you uh, degrade pattern separation, you degrade basically uh, uh, the uh, ability to discriminate those orders. So based on our prediction of the correlation between the amount of pattern separation and behavior, we see here, uh, and we think we can say that there is a causal relationship. So the more the pattern are separated by the olfactory bulb, the easier it is for the mouse to discriminate uh, orders. What is important is that this, this process is only important if it's uh, uh, required. So that means that this is only valid if the orders are highly correlated. So if we have uh, uh, simple orders uh, that are not correlated uh, at all, so that means that their input are already very different, 
we see that for the first, the pattern separation is not improved by chanorhodopsin. It's actually even slightly deteriorated, but not significant. Uh, and uh, the learning uh, is not affected. So we take this as a, uh, as an, uh, a sign that basically the, the representation in the glomerular are so different that you can basically do whatever you want. Uh, the mouse would still uh, discriminate those representations. There is no challenge there. And this is, a, 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 this is the same mice, another group of animals, another uh, set of mixtures. And you see that when uh, in the same mice we uh, stimulate for the mixture, we have a nice uh, improvement in this, uh, in this case. So the, the conclusion uh, of this uh, part is that basically uh, we think we can say that uh, the other representation is described by cell assemblies in the uh, mitral and tufted cell population of the olfactory bulb. The more the representation are separated, the easier uh, it is for the mouse to uh, disambiguate uh, uh, related compounds. So basically, pattern separation is in fact a computation that is done and is very behaviorally relevant uh, uh, in, uh, in the brain. But what we also saw that with the uh, inhibitory dread uh, experiment, that in some cases, you may not want to necessarily separate representation, but if you deteriorate this, uh, 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 separation, you may group uh, stimuli together uh, instead of uh, uh, discriminating them. Okay, in the last uh, couple of minutes I have, I would like to uh, continue uh, further because, of course, here what I showed you is uh, an external manipulation. So I showed you that basically if, you know, as an experimenter we try to tap in the olfactory bulb, if we decorrelate or not the representation, we can assist or not uh, the, the behavior. But this is not showing you that basically during active learning, we know that these, my, these uh, odors can be discriminated, it takes time, but they can be discriminated. So if they, are not, if they are correlated at the beginning of the discrimination, are they changing over time uh, as a function of the, uh, the, the learning process? And that's where the plasticity of the representation is important. So the question is, at the beginning of the behavior, the representation would be uh, highly correlated. Is during learning a plasticity, an ensemble plasticity process taking place to actually improve naturally in the brain uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this distance uh, uh, between a representation? Okay, so to, to address this question, unfortunately, we cannot do a, a tetral recording over uh, many days. Uh, we cannot sample uh, for sure the very same cell. So we switch to, uh, to photon calcium imaging and I don't have to introduce that because uh, Florin did. So we basically uh, uh, forced the uh, uh, expression of uh, uh, calcium indicator, GCAM6S, in a mitral and tufted cell. And you see here uh, one of the optical plane in awake, awake mice. So we see here uh, the, the cells. Uh, I think these are tufted cells, if I, if, I, if I remember. OK. So uh, this basically, uh, uh, we, we use the PCDH20. Uh, Cree RT2 uh, transgenic line that was either uh, infected with AVs or we also had some experiment with a, an old uh, GCAM3 mouse, but I will not discuss this experiment. And by just varying the plane, so either we, we can image the tufted cell or the mitral cell independently. And so, uh, uh, of course, uh, the advantage that uh, uh, while the animal is basically doing behavior, uh, uh, we can, uh, so here, here we have a mouse that is responding to uh, S plus uh, odor after being trained. At the same time, we can basically monitor the calcium response that is evoked by, uh, by one of the, uh, of the mixtures. So uh, as I said from the beginning, uh, and I I've always been a bit concerned by calcium imaging uh, uh, to address uh, this question because they have a slow temporal time scale. So here, basically, the, the, the bar is 1.5 second of other application. So you see that the other response is basically over you know, uh, the duration of the, uh, the other response. And it has nothing to do with the temporal dynamics I've showed you at the beginning in a couple of uh, tens of milliseconds. Uh, so uh, the, the, this has the limitation but, uh, of the calcium, uh, uh, the calcium uh, signal. But still, uh, when we analyzed uh, uh, the response of the uh, odor evoked response in cell assemblies of mitral and tufted cell, it's the same. It's the same finding. Basically, we saw that some cells were excited, and we see that as an increase of calcium response, and other cells uh, uh, were inhibited, as seen by this decrease of the calcium 
uh, in respect to the baseline. That was somehow controversial uh, uh, due to the uh, Komiyama paper, but basically uh, we observed that systematically. And on average, this is not very visible in this case, but we have roughly 50-50% uh, 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 of the cell responding. It's not all the cells that are responding, but the cells that are responding uh, ex uh, exhibit either an excitatory or an inhibitory response, roughly in the same, uh, the same fraction. And we also observe on response and off response that are uh, available, uh, seen in the literature. Yes, exactly. Although it was in an anesthetized animal. So this is in, in a way. Okay, so I will not uh, go too much into the detail of the, all this. So uh, basically, the, the calcium describes uh, what we see in, uh, in electrophysiology, but we lose the temporal, uh, the temporal dynamics, the fast temporal dynamics that we have. But we gain the ability to track the same cell assembly over time and look at remapping if there is uh, any. So uh, I will just uh, uh, go uh, quickly in this, uh, in this uh, last slide. So basically, we see here uh, the odor evoked response in the population of cells that were recorded during the behavior. Uh, this is the mixture, uh, mixture one, mixture two. So uh, one, it would be an S plus. One, the other one would be the S minus. And uh, you see here uh, the representation evoked over time. So this is the baseline activity. And, th and then you have uh, here uh, uh, the uh, uh, other response uh, over time. And so what we do is basically we look at the correlation uh, over time. So we correlate a vector in time between this order and this order. And basically this describes you uh, how the uh, representation is evolving over time. So on the baseline, there, are, uh, there is low correlation. When we apply the other, uh, these uh, other are highly correlated. That's what you see here. And it remains correlated for a couple of uh, hundreds of milliseconds post, uh, post order. So this is the first day when the animal is start, starting to be engaged in this uh, behavior discrimination. So these mixtures are highly correlated. And what we, uh, what we notice that after uh, six days of training, when the animals are reaching 90% uh, accuracy almost, uh, basically, if we take the same two orders the, uh, and we calculate the correlation, we basically see that the correlation now is becoming uh, much uh, less than it was uh, on day one. So here, we basically see then this uh, process of pattern separation taking place. And so if we plot in the same mouse the behavior and the uh, correlation in the cell assembly that we have imaged, it's not all the cell, it's just a fraction of the cell in the olfactory bulb, what we basically see is a direct relationship between the amount of pattern separation during learning and the increase of uh, 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 performance in this, uh, in this mouse. So it does not really matter where we are imaging, apparently, as long as we are in a field where the cells are responding. Basically, over days, uh, we start uh, to have uh, uh, correlated orders that are hard to discriminate. And during uh, these uh, uh, days of learning, uh, we improve uh, the decorrelation and we improve the, uh, the learn. So uh, I don't want to go too much into the detail, but so some cells uh, reduce their response. Other cells, new cells are coming in the cell assembly, so you have a complete remapping of the representation. On average, you have a, you have a slight decrease of amplitude, but it, it's not that, I mean, it's significant. No, no. No, no. So uh, we just, uh, and this is the last, uh, the last slide, uh, uh, we wanted to test the specificity of this finding. So uh, yeah, this is basically a mitral, mitral cell uh, uh, that were imaged. So we see this uh, uh, direct relationship between behavior and the correlation. If we do the same type of uh, imaging in mice that are exposed to the same number of trials, the same number of days, <laughs> but are, that are not engaged in the, in the behavioral task, so this is a passive training. Basically, we don't see uh, a very strong decorrelation. There is a slight uh, change, but this is not uh, 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 really uh, significant over the time course. And to, so this would basically say that uh, uh, we have uh, a context-dependent remapping. So if the mouse is engaged in behavior, this remapping is taking place. If it's not engaging behavior in an associative learning, this remapping is not taking place. And the last 
piece of data uh, was really uh, was really surprising initially, uh, but based on what you've heard already, you may be not necessarily uh, uh, surprised anymore. So, because uh, we have the ability to uh, uh, monitor now with optical sectioning either the mitral cell plane or the tufted cell plane, we can analyze independently those two cells uh, type that have been for many uh, uh, years considered doing the same, but we know now that they project in different uh, uh, territories. And if we do the same type of uh, uh, imaging in tufted cell, we see that they also have highly correlated representation on day one, but after learning, these uh, uh, patterns are less, much less separated than they are in the mitral and tufted cell. To the extent that this, uh, if we, if we uh, uh, relate the behavior in the, mitral, in the, in the tufted cell uh, to the uh, correlation, we see no uh, uh, real uh, regression. That was the case in the mitral cell. So basically, uh, uh, not only we, ha we have a context-dependent remapping, but we also have in the circuit a cell-type-dependent uh, uh, remapping. So uh, this is the, the, the last conclusion of the paper. So uh, the inputs uh, uh, are converging on both mitral and tufted cells here. I showed them in two different glomeruli, but obviously they share uh, the, same, uh, the same glomeruli. Uh, so we have two different uh, uh, parallel pathway of information. And interestingly, uh, only this pathway is submitted to uh, be uh, separated in terms of uh, uh, representation. So the ensemble plasticity that we, uh, we have uncovered is uh, specific to the, uh, to the mitral cell and the context. So in the tufted cell uh, uh, is not uh, affected by, the, by, this, uh, by this plasticity. And the, the, the question is whether you know, this would basically, I mean, why, why, why would the, the tufted cell be not affected? So if you affect uh, the representation by uh, pattern separation, you improve your ability to discriminate uh, uh, two others that were at the beginning nearly identical, but you lose information because they become uh, uh, separated and you don't know that at the beginning they were, they were similar. But if you maintain this uh, line of information in the tufted cell, in fact, you have gained information. You know that your, your others can be discriminated, that they are different, but you maintain the fact that they were similar at the beginning. And so, uh, we think that uh, this would be uh, useful for uh, basically learning to discriminate, and this would be uh, useful to maintain uh, then the information that they were similar. And so uh, we don't know about the, the, the mechanism uh, explaining this differential, uh, this differential process. We know that it cannot come from uh, the input because they are the same for the two uh, population of neurons, but it's likely based on, uh, on the work of uh, Dinu and Veanu and what we know also in the literature that there are different types of granule cell the different types of cortical feedback impinging on different type of granule cell could potentially uh, alter specifically the representation in the mitral cell assembly and leaving the tufted cell ensemble un uh, unaffected. And with this, I would like to uh, finish uh, uh, with the acknowledgement. So uh, uh, the work on uh, pattern separation uh, was done by Olivier Schwend and uh, uh, Nixon Abraham and Samuel Lagier and the work on uh, the plasticity of the representation with two photons was done by Kelly Bokorali and uh, Yoshi Yamada. And this is a long lasting collaboration with my friend and colleague, Ivan Rodriguez, uh, and the, uh, the um, uh, KCC2 story was done in collaboration with Thomas Jentsch uh, Lab and uh, Catherine Goddard. And this is all the funding agencies that are uh, paying for the goodies. I would like to thank you for your attention.